Amen. That's a great song. I was not familiar with that one, and I'm looking forward to learning it with you. Well, a few uh, weeks ago, my wife and I celebrated our 40th wedding anniversary, and something that we've had on our to-do list uh, for years is to go up to Maine. And uh, so we did that. And so I uh, was on the internet looking for a place to, you know, Maine's a pretty big state. And really why I wanted to go to Maine, because I, I wanted to eat a lot of lobster. And uh, we did some of that. But uh, I found a place, I didn't want to drive clear up into Maine. And so I said, we'll just get a taste of it. So I, we, we found this really nice bed and breakfast on the waterfront in uh, a little town uh, just into uh, Maine, north of Boston, York, Maine. And uh, just had a great time. And uh, sea turtles on the top right corner there. <laughs> Uh, one of the things that we did was we, we, we brought our bikes. So we've kind of gotten into bike riding. Uh, we just have enjoyed that for both exercise and, and fun. And uh, so we brought our bikes, and uh, I really had no idea what to expect in light of where we were and what we would find and such. And I grew up on the New Jersey uh, coast, and so I'm used to that kind of a beach. Entirely different in light of a very rocky shoreline and such. And so my wife and I went on a variety of excursions on our bikes and just thoroughly enjoyed not only the beauty of the surroundings, but these absolutely stunning, gorgeous homes. <laughs> Uh, vacation homes, homes where people lived uh, year-round or, or just came uh, in the course of uh, the season there. And on uh, one of our excursions, uh, we, we passed this particular place. And uh, what you can't appreciate here is their backyard, because their backyard was like a, a drop of about, I don't know, 75 to 100 feet straight down sheer rocks and the, and the ocean right there. It's absolutely gorgeous. But we drove by that house, and I uh, caught that little sign above the garage doors, uh, Someday Happened. And we continued to pedal on past it uh, to our destination, and I could not get that out of my mind, thinking, Someday Happened. Someday Happened. Someday Happened. I don't know this person who owns that beautiful house, uh, whether or not their dream was to retire early and home right there on that location. But for them, that dream, that culmination of their life, someday happened. For the believer in Jesus Christ, someday is eternity. And someday is going to happen. Someday we are going to stand before God and give an account as to whether or not we invested our lives in that which mattered or we squandered them and spent our lives in the camp of the uncommitted. Someday is going to happen when God is wonderfully going to wipe away all tears from our eyes and all pain and sorrow and misery is going to be no more. Someday is that day when that chorus that many of us sang growing up, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus, will be stunningly realized. And at that day, it is our prayer that many of us will be with us in heaven because we cared for what matters and we cared for what lasts. And that is the salvation of an eternal soul for the cause and sake and glory of Jesus Christ. Someday is going to happen, and it's our desire that we be a people with that reality in view, and with that reality in view, are about rescue and about care that matters. Let's pray as we begin. Father, we have just a few moments here, and we're so inadequate in so many ways. But God, I'm thankful for this passage this morning that, that encourages us in your sufficiency, in 
and your capacity to do that, which we are absolutely unable to do so. And so I pray that, that, that at this time, you would use your word to encourage us, to instruct us, to transform us, to mold us and to shape us, empower us and equip us to be your people and to be about your calling in our lives. And so we pray this for the cause and glory of your Son who has rescued us so that we might rescue. Amen. Several weeks ago when we began this series, I shared this quote by D.L. Moody, there is no greater honor than to be the instrument in God's hands to lead one person out of the kingdom of darkness and into the glorious light of heaven. And it's our desire that, that we be a people who really want to be this person, that we are a people who don't want to sit on the sidelines, but want to get engaged in that which really matters in being an instrument of God's hand of rescue. And the journey that we're walking through in order to accomplish this and our desire to learn and grow is to make sure that, that we are grounded in the storyline of the Bible, that we are grounded in the major themes of the scriptures. And so we have been tracking that each and every week. And so today uh, we come to the question before us that we started off with, why is it? Why is it that some are better than others at spiritual rescue? Well, it's not only because they understand God. It's not only because they understand man and the problem of sin. It's not only that they understand the significance of Jesus Christ, as we saw last Sunday with Pastor Corey. But this Sunday, why is it that some are better than others at spiritual rescue? It's because they know, they understand the significance of of the Holy Spirit. And this morning, we're going to be looking at a key New Testament passage in John chapter 14 through 17. You can take your Bibles and turn there. And tonight, we're going to continue on this theme, and we're going to be looking at another key New Testament chapter that helps us understand the person and work of the Holy Spirit, and that's going to be Romans chapter 8. Because, you know, sometimes in light of our desire to be rescuers, we find ourselves sinking. We find ourselves struggling. And so the help of Romans chapter 8 that we'll see tonight is how, how the Holy Spirit will help you from going under in light of the struggles and challenges of life, in light of all that we experience, and yet also desiring to be a part of what he's called us to be about in having a heart of rescue. Well, this morning we're looking at John chapter 14 through chapter 17, and we're just going to be looking at some selected verses. And just a little bit of context about what's going on here in this very significant passage of Scripture. Jesus is instructing his apostles, very unique and special people who had a very unique and special ministry that could be encapsulated into two basic emphases in that he is preparing them for the supernatural ministry that they're going to be having in writing down God's revelation called the New Testament that we have today. And so he's talking to them about what they're going to be doing in light of that very real responsibility. And he's not only instructing them in that, but yet he's, he's instructing them in how they're going to be used to establish God's plan and program for and that being the church. And so the question is, how are they going to do this? How are they going to be used by God to write the New Testament? How are they going to be used to establish God's plan and program today? And what we see here is that Jesus gives them a bombshell truth that they never dreamed imaginable, that they had not fully wrapped their brains around, and that was the permanent possession of the Holy their lives. And so in light of that truth, that's the background that we see here. And these chapters here before us uh, not only ground us in an understanding of, of the fundamental ministry of the Holy Spirit, uh, but rather it helps us uh, with our theme and its question here this morning, if we're going to have hearts of rescue, 
How does the Holy Spirit drive those who care? What is he doing in and of our lives in our desire to be a part of his plan and program uh, for today? And so what we're going to do, and I've just unpacked five truths this morning that we're going to be looking. There's a whole lot more, but this is just kind of an overview of what we see in light of our theme of how the Holy Spirit drives those who care. What does he do? Well, the first thing that we see is this. He fills you with confidence. He fills you with confidence. You see, in the book of Acts, when we get there, which is the next book, it's the first book after the Gospels, which is the start and beginning of the church age, in that book we see the Gospels' most powerful advances come via the hands of ordinary people just like you and just like me. And these first disciples of the church are experienced have experienced the fulfillment of this promise that we see first of all in John chapter 14 and verse 12. Here's what they experienced. Know what it says there in chapter 14 and verse 12. Most assuredly, Jesus says this, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And here it is, and greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. Did he catch that? Greater works will they do. Greater works than Jesus did? Did they really do greater works than Jesus? I mean, have you? Have you ever walked on water, raised the dead, or, or multiplied loaves and fishes? And yet Jesus said that and our works would be greater than his. How? By the fact that our preaching and our witnessing to Jesus' finished work leads people to the salvation that his miracles only foreshadowed. You see, Jesus' miracles were signs pointing to the greatest of all miracles, and that is salvation of the world from the awful curse of sin. That is the greatest miracle of all. And Jesus, in the course of his ministry, he opened physically blind eyes to illustrate how our witnessing opens spiritually blind eyes. Jesus multiplied bread to feed hungry stomachs to illustrate how our witnessing feeds the bread of life to hungry souls. And so think about it. What's truly greater, the healing of a, of a temporary limb or the saving of an eternal life? Jesus clearly said, it's the latter. It's the latter. The greatest work that you can be engaged in is, the, is communicating the truth about me that alone transforms lives. And so in light of the work of the Holy Spirit, he wants to produce in you a greater work, and that reality drives his people with confidence. How else does the Holy Spirit drive those who carry? Not only fills you with confidence, but secondly, he gives you capacity. He gives you capacity. You know, you ever think, how awesome would it be to, to walk around with Jesus for, for three years? I mean, those guys had it made. Can you imagine what it would have been like? You know, you're, you got this tough theological question and so you ask Jesus, and bam, he gives you the answer. You're, you're holding a party with your friends, and you, you run out of Doritos. And he gathers all the crumbs and multiplies it so everybody has enough, and, 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 and bam, there's 12 bags full left over. You know? I mean, your, your dog gets run over. Bam, he resurrects it and brings it back to life. Your cat gets run over. He digs a hole and helps you bury it. <laughs> Sorry. I didn't want to tell that joke, but Pastor Corey made me. 
maybe it wasn't exactly like that, but, but, but note here in our passage what, what Jesus says here in chapter 14, verse 16 and 17. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. Here Jesus tells him that he's going to give them another helper. And that word another means another of the same kind. And the word helper literally means a helper, a comforter, someone who comes alongside you, a counselor, an encourager, an, an intercessor, an, uh, an, uh, an advocate. You see, the point simply is this. Jesus would send another helper exactly like himself, a person who could take his place and empower his work. And, and this person, amazingly, would be with them forever. He would never leave them. And, and he would be someone who would guide them in a supernatural way according to truth. He is the spirit of truth. But note Jesus' stunning revelation at the end of verse 17 there, for he dwells with you right now. He's talking to his disciples here. And will be in you. Will be in you. Acts chapter 2, bam, that's when it happens. That's when it begins in the believer's now permanent possession of the Holy Spirit. And here Jesus tells them that the Spirit's presence inside them will be better than if himself were beside them. It's amazing truth. You now, we think so many times, man, if only Jesus were right here. If only Je Jesus is right here. He's inside you if you are a child of God. And that's an amazing truth that, that we as God's people really need to wrap our brains around and really need to begin living in of that amazing truth that Jesus Christ in the person of the third person of the Godhead in the Holy Spirit resides in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory, it says in Colossians. You see, the point is this. Personal relationship has always been God's plan. He has always been a God who is close and present, but only since Jesus returned to heaven has he taken up residence inside of us. See, what ours is right now is the same ministry of Jesus. It is an incarnational ministry. We are the incarnates of Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit resident in us. God is vitally present in and through his people, and our need is to grasp that fact and act in that capacity. Well, how else does the Holy Spirit drive those who care? Well, he testifies of Christ through you. He testifies of Christ through you. Note there in chapter 15, flip over to that chapter there, and verse 26 and what it says there. Chapter 15, verse 26. But when the helper, again, he's using this term frequently in these chapters. But when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, that's what he is about, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. See, this is the Holy Spirit's work. He will testify of Jesus the privilege to fly a little bit and a couple of times I've had the privilege to fly into Washington DC and in one particular time I had the privilege to fly into Washington DC at nighttime and it's absolutely stunning as you fly uh, uh, right next to the skyline there of of the Capitol and all the monuments and you see them lit up at night you see the Washington Monument there just standing in its, uh, its stark beauty there. And, and as you, you look at all those monuments um, there, you don't think, man, look at all those floodlights. 
I wonder how many watts they are. No, you don't think about that at all. You're looking at the main object. You're not looking at the floodlights. You're not drawn to, to those. See, the purpose of the floodlight is to shine on the object. And that's the whole person and work of the Holy Spirit. His is a floodlight ministry that illuminates the person and work of Jesus Christ. He's not about himself. He's about Jesus. That's who he magnifies. You see, the Holy Spirit's primary ministry to the lost world is to testify of the person and work of Jesus Christ. And our message today is not political activism. It's not social reform or psychological self-fulfillment. But our ministry today is to magnify the person and work of Jesus Christ as the Holy Spirit works in and through us. And the Holy Spirit enables you to effectively testify about Jesus. The spotlight, what's the spotlight of our lives? The spotlight of our lives is Jesus. The spotlight of our lives is, is not about a religion. It's not about a denominational title. No, our spotlight is all about the relationship that Jesus came to this earth and died, gave his life for, so that we might be connected to him and to the Father and be assured of our eternity in heaven with him. He testifies of Christ through you. How else does the Holy Spirit drive those who care? Well, he makes you a vessel of conviction. He makes you a vessel of conviction. Note chapter 16 and verse 7 through 11 here. Know what it says there. He makes you a vessel of conviction. Nevertheless, Jesus says, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper, again, talking about the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. See, it's the, the work of the Holy Spirit to produce this in people's lives. But how does he do that? He does it through the power of the word through you and through me. And know what it says there. Here's what he does. He convicts. While in a judicial sense, that word is oftentimes viewed negatively. If you get convicted, that's not a good day on your calendar. Uh, but theologically here, the Spirit's convicting ministry is, is an incredibly positive one because his goal is to bring lost people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And, and note here, he convicts of three things. He convicts, first of all, of sin. And that's a singular term there, and it's tense, uh, he, he's talking about sin collectively. It's the essence of who I am. What the Holy Spirit does is that he causes me to see that in the essence of who I am, my default is that I'm nothing other than sinful and unable to please God. I have no ability in and of myself to honor and please God. And the outworking of my life simply gives evidence of my spiritual hijacking of my life to live it my way rather than God's way. And he convicts me of that awful reality, that awful robbing that I make of living for myself and my agenda, of my someday being about my dreams and my ambitions and, and my goals and the things that I think are going to make me happy rather than for the one who died for me and gave his life for me. He convicts the world of sin. He convicts the world, note there, of, of righteousness. Verse 10 is interesting. It says, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. See, he convicts me of, of that which I lack, <laughs> that, that I am disqualified, that all my, quote-unquote, righteousness is as a filthy rag. 
I have nothing good in and of myself. I am not qualified to stand before God, much less to enter into heaven. And only Jesus is qualified. Only Jesus, as you see there, can go to his Father. Why? Because only Jesus is qualified. And what Jesus does as I look to him in faith and ask him to rescue me is that he gives me his complete, perfect righteousness. He takes my sin upon himself. He gives me his righteousness, and he qualifies me for heaven. He not only convicts me of my sin and of my lack of righteousness, but he also convicts me of, note there, judgment, verse 11 of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. It's the awful end game of those who have embraced the world system and have followed the ruler of this world rather than the king of kings and lord of lords that we've been so privileged to sing about this morning. And he causes me to see that I am undone that I am desperately in need of, of rescue. How does a person understand that they are spiritually drowning? How does that take place? It's the Spirit of God's using his truth to convict of what they are, what they don't have, and what they desperately need, and that's the righteousness of Jesus Christ that alone qualifies them and is the ticket to eternal life. Well, how else does the Holy Spirit drive those who care? He makes it compelling. Note there verse 20 in chapter 17. This is fascinating. This is often called chapter 17 of John, called the Jesus' high priestly prayer, where he is praying not only for his disciples here, but he's praying for those who ultimately will come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. This prayer of Jesus included you and me in it. And note here what it says in chapter 17 and verse 20, where Jesus says this, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Fascinating. How does the Holy Spirit drive those who care? He makes you compelling. He does something in your heart so that your speech reveals that, that Jesus Christ is a one-of-a-kind being, that Jesus Christ is the one to whom all men must reckon themselves. And he uses you because of your transformation, because of your rescue, and through your words in communicating his truth to be a compelling testimony of what Jesus alone can do. Well, in light of that, here's our last question. What happens when you get this? What happens when you really embrace this? What happens when you, when you understand this in light of your desire to be about the main thing of rescue? Well, first of all, you're not intimidated by chaos. This was the same final point that I had in my message when we talked about God. But remember, it was the Spirit of God who was hovering above the waters, Genesis chapter 1. And it was the Spirit of God who took that which was in a state of chaos and turmoil and shaped and formed it and brought it to a state of beauty and rest and completion. And so what happens when you get this? What happens when you get this is that you're not intimidated by chaos. You know, you might be thinking about, and Pastor Corey had us last week come up here and pray for people that, that were burdened for at the end of the message. And you might be burdened for people that those situations are just sticky wickets and just all in a state of, of, of mess. And, and, and it's just a situation that is so, so beyond you. And, and, and you don't know what to do about it. I'll never forget when I was a, a young pastor when we were down in Virginia. I was by myself at the time. And, 
And, um, and after a, a morning service, a couple came up and asked me if I would meet with them. They were in serious crisis mode in their marriage. And I was just young in light of my ministry background and such. And, and I can't remember exactly what it was if, if he had had an affair or something, but it was a major, major issue. And, and I will never forget driving to their house scared to death, not knowing what in the world I would face, not knowing what in the world I would say. And I remember all I did that entire time was pray this, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Oh God, God, only you can help this situation. God, only you can meet this need. And I'll never forget that time when we sat with them and we heard their story. And, and, and it was just like the Spirit of God just took his word and it just came. And it was an incredible evening of, of reconciliation for that couple. And it wasn't at all because I was great or I was skilled, but, but I know that was like one of my first experiences of the Spirit of God working through my nothingness and taking his truth that alone sets people free and accomplishing his work. You know, I want to encourage you, if you have a situation right now in front of you that's chaotic, that you're, that you're burdened for, listen. You are unstoppable. You are unstoppable when the Spirit of God is at work in your life because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And he is your helper. And he, lo and behold, can use you to bring tranquility out of those situations of chaos. Just like what we heard this morning with Kristen's testimony and Josh's. You're not intimidated by chaos. You're all about Christ. You know, this morning is a good thing sometimes to stop and think, you know, what have I really been all about lately? <laughs> what have I been all about? What's, what's getting me angry these days? What am I all nervous about? What am I worried and fretting about? But, but am I about Jesus? You see, that's your need, to be about Jesus and the New Testament is all about the story of how ordinary people, people with problems and faults and stubborn habits and personal weaknesses, experienced Jesus' transforming work. And as he came alongside, as they came alongside needy people, they say, you know, I, I understand exactly where you were, where you are, because that's where I was. And, and let me introduce you to Jesus Christ. What happens when you get this? Your life carries weight. I'm not talking about people being scared of you. But we've said this before, you know, when you walk into a room, what do you bring into it? It's a good question to ask yourself. You know, would you follow you? Is your life so absorbed by truth that that, that your life, as it shines before others, brings the reality that, you know what, there's got to be something more to this. There's got to be something more. And, and that person has it. What is it that's making them tick? That's what happens when you get this. And as well, what happens when you get this? You confidently go after it because you know this is what God does. And you seize the moment. You seize the truth that, that Jesus is in you and with you. 
and he'll never leave you alone. Last week, as I reminded you when we closed this message, we had an opportunity for you to come forward and to pray for people that, that you might be burdened for, people that you're desirous to experience spiritual rescue. And we're going to do that again. Maybe you didn't get an opportunity to do that last week. But this week, what we're going to do is we're going to sing a great song prayerfully, and Ben's going to lead us in it, that is about the person and work of the Holy Spirit. And, and this morning, maybe you are burdened for a situation, an individual, that, that their life is just in chaos, and, and you don't know how to fix it. You know what? Here's the beauty of it. You don't have to fix it. You just have to give God's truth and let him do his work of repair. And you might be burdened as well in light of your, your, your desire to be, to be really what you need to be, that you need to be more about Jesus. You've been about maybe other things. And in, and in light of, of your desire to take that first step and do something, you know, to pray about it, is one of those first steps that you can take. And, and as Ben leads us in this song here at this time, We'd invite you, if you'd like to come forward, just like you did last week, and just pray here and just ask for God's grace in rescuing that person, in using you to be an instrument of rescue, in bringing people out of chaos, in helping you to be more the reflector of Jesus that you desire to be in your desire to honor him in your life. So Ben, come and lead us. And as we sing this song, if you'd like to come up front again, in light of your desire to, to do something, it starts with prayer. And you can come up here and do that in light of your commitment to honor God as a vehicle of his rescue. Lead us on the road 
again we exist to help you in your spiritual journey and perhaps if you are here and uncertain about your standing before God and what it means to have a, a real relationship with Jesus Christ we would love the opportunity to talk with you and encourage you to get in touch with us at your earliest convenience to hear what your questions are and to unpack God's answers his truth that sets you free thank you for coming you're dismissed <laughs>